Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Peace and blessings to you all. It's great to have you with us again today. I'm your instructor in this course, Dustin Cron, founder of the Center for Global Muslim Life, the founder of Beyond Border Studios. And this is the, the problem with this course is that it's such a huge topic, right? To do both branding, just branding alone, you could take a course that's an entire semester. Uh, to do courses on content development, you could you could take entire degrees, right? And so I think it's important that you're always learning, and I think that that's why you all are in this course. It's important that you're constantly consuming content, uh, looking for great examples of what it is that you're trying to do. I think that so much of the best artistry, like they say, is, is you know people take from one another. They they learn from one another, they build on top of each other, and beauty inspires beauty, as we talked about uh, in the last lecture. So we're going to try to get through a ton of content. I actually had to split this lecture into two because I'm going to focus almost this entire lecture just on branding because it's, it's so huge um, to really, while also talking about content development and how building your brand relates to content and how we get this content puzzle right, right? That that there's so many layers to this. There's the audience development components. There's uh, the language components, which myself, you know, I started as a writer. And I always go back to that, that, that part of what has set some of the work that I've done apart has been the writing, has been, you know, the language. Language is as important as design within branding and i think a lot of people miss that point right that they that they go everything is so design heavy and then you spend no time on copy you spend no time on getting the language right when you, especially in today's internet so much is about language and making sure that your brand hits on exactly what it is that you're trying to do and at the end of this um at the end of this lecture, I'll go into to some examples of that where we really go more in depth. You know, I want to get to to all the video and social media components and all the content development components. I'm going to do that in part B. So this is going to be part A, mostly focused on branding and uh, on on four examples, right? So so one is of course the brand audit, which matters for every organization. How you do branding from scratch how you brand shift in an organization that's unwilling or not ready to change its brand, and then how you do a rebrand when you realize that your brand has become less relevant than it should be in this age or that maybe it was, wasn't created with things like uh, search engine optimization in mind and you may not be hitting the right metrics that you're looking for uh, online, right? So with that, we'll, we'll get started. Um, we're going to have these weekly Q&A sessions where we can go more in depth uh, into question and answers, right? So, so really, this is about content development and digital production in 2020. And we want to go into the big points from that we went over last week, right? That there's the five most important points. Number one, that culture is everything in this work. The culture you create around yourself and your organization is the foundation of getting this right, of, of building a team, of making people attracted to, the, to your brand, uh, that you have to build an ecosystem that will attract talent, right? If you don't have the right culture, you can never build an ecosystem, that every organization is now a digital organization, and that to do this well, you have to build brands and organizations that empower their creative talent foundationally. And finally, that stories are at the center of every uh, single part of our lives. So again, the, the four areas that we're gonna focus on in this, this session are this idea of brand audit and brand strategy, building a brand, rebranding, and brand shifting. I think that, you know, this, so how do you think about your brand? This is the really big picture here is that, is that A, you really have to have an idea of what audience you want to go after. That has to do with, like we, we talked about in the last session, it has to do with age, 
It has to do with race. It has to do with class. It has to do with the segmentations of, of your audience. Um, maybe you're going after a donor audience rather than, than as well as regular consumers of your content if you're a nonprofit. Again, the language, copy, and slogans. Um, art direction is, as, as I'll talk about, is as important as as the design itself because in most cases, you will, of course, you're always going to know what you want with your brand more than any designer will. Who mo most designers, if you're working with designers who are not in house, which most of you will be, and are full time consultants, they'll be jumping from project to project throughout their week, right? Throughout their day. And so you really have to tell your story well to those designers and give them a lot of art direction for. For them to get it right right that that and, and i think that that with that as we'll go into developing a mood board um together is is super important because because those mood boards will set the standard as for what it is that you're trying uh to do what is the design language of your brand what are the web templates you're looking at as you're building your brand what kind of social media presence and campaigns do you want to build out uh, can you write a manifesto for your brand? We'll go into this idea of, um, of video-based manifestos and the prevalence of those today. They're a really good way to, to translate your, your brand online. Um, and, then how do you, and then how do you test the whole thing, right? How do you test the whole thing to, to make sure that your audience is actually consuming your content? So content, the way I always think about content is that content is like a giant puzzle telling the story of your brand. And what are all the different pieces and components that you have? Each part of what we just went over is a, is a part of this larger content strategy of your brand strategy. So how do you fit all those pieces together without shoving them in as we all did when we were kids uh, playing with puzzles, right? How do, without shoving the pieces together, things should go smoothly. Things should go where they're supposed to go and you should be able uh, to build a, co a cohesive whole within this work. So this is a, a, a brand a brand audit template that, that we use with clients. And uh, I, I linked this, of course, in the this week's readings materials. It's and, and you can use this yourselves. All you do is go into the file section of, of Google Docs and press copy. And you can easily create a copy of this for yourself. And what this is about is going through each part of your brand and, and for some of you, this may not be relevant to have the past, present, and future uh, boxes, but for the organizations who are taking the course, most of you are existing organizations. Uh, I think all of you are existing organizations that, that you'll be able to go through each part, right? So what does your brand look like in the past related to each of these different uh, categories? Rather, do you have a brand kit? Have you done an audience map? What email servers are you using? What what type? What have your emails newsletters have looked like? Do you have what type of growth do you have right uh, within each of these things? And that's another template that I that I link to this week as well. That there's a set of templates where you can really begin to track your growth metrics because you should you should always be thinking about um, how you how you grow your content and not just how. Uh, you're, you're stagnated, right? Because if you're not growing as a brand, then you just are, are consistent. And if you're, you want to make sure that you're, that you're consistently uh, growing your audience and that your audience isn't stagnated, how is your SEO? Um, all these different things are super important as it relates to, to brand building. And so, yeah, I hope that, that I hope that that's useful. Again, this idea of audience that we touched on last week, you should really be able to create an audience map. I, I really love this map of Wikipedia where they're talking about uh, all the different levels within their audience, how who they're building with, right? Their volunteers, their, who, are, who is trying to disrupt them uh, even, right? Who are they? Who are the people that are distributing the content? The publishers, the content syndicators, uh, etc. Right? The partners that they're working with. Who's using? 
their website. The casual learners, the curious info seekers, the unknowing learners, the tech consumers, um, who are their financiers, right? How are they thinking about uh, the finan their financiers as you know a key part of their audience? And so, so with that, right, what are all the different segmentations? Do you have an idea uh, if you're building a brand of who exactly you're going after? What are their what are their demographics? And this should be you know this you can really make up whole customer segment segments and and talk about someone down to their clothes um, what do they look like you can you can draw them out if you want to um, and then if you have that data feedback if you're able to see what countries uh, you know your consumers are in you can make a lot of educated guess, guesses before you launch something but then go always go back to your data like we talked about in the last the last lecture where everything is a constant loop, right? Where you're you're iterating, you're producing content, uh, and then you're getting that data feedback. And then from that, you're taking the data feedback and you're creating content or you're double down, doubling down on, on the best content. So, you know, for this lecture, I think I talked a bit about my friend, Dr. Jonathan Wilson. I really highly recommend his book, Halal Branding. I think it's it's really beautiful and it's so beyond just halal. He really gets into what is diverse global uh, marketing to these global audiences of, of people who are diasporic peoples, which I think the majority of you taking this course, either you're focused on Muslim populations or you're focused on uh, other other communities of color that really don't work in the traditional market segmentation where they consume global content they they look at things through a different lens than what uh, historically white audiences would look at and the way things are historically marketed so dr. Jonathan goes through all of that in this 400 page book super highly recommended and I use here his definition of what exactly is um, is branding, right? Where he talks about a brand buys you something and you're trying to get, you know, buy-in from your audience, which is a blend of tangible and intangible functions. It is a human form of cultural expression designed to com communicate meaning. What is the foundationally, this is about meaning and deliver current or future value, which may accrue over time, right? Branding is a strategic and concise means of expressing, amplifying, and controlling who you are, what you do, who you're associated with, and what you own for competitive gains using a variety of communication methods and media that are both collab collaborative and measurable. Um, and I think this is a really brilliant brilliant piece by, by Dr. Jonathan that foundationally gets at this idea that our brands are about touching people. I always, one of the best trainings I ever took was by this group of actors called the aerial group. And it was a, a training about public speaking, but so much of this can relate to branding as well, where the reason why the actors were teaching public speaking is because what an actor thinks about when uh, they're on the stage, especially in the theater where they're interacting with audiences every night is what, is the emotion I want to convey to the audience, right? So much of, of the film world, the power of film, so much of it is in, the, is in the acting, the embodiment of a character by the actor. And that has to do with the feeling that, that you receive, uh, receive from them. And so again, this idea of branding as, as really a creative expression to amplify and control uh, how people think about you really so foundationally thinking about this idea of how do you want to make people feel when you're creating a brand so when I when I'm when I begin working on a brand you know and there's a lot of different ways to, to of course work on brand building 
Um, some people use methods like uh, design thinking. If you really have no ideas, if you really need to, to think about a product in a deep way, of course, IDEO is the most famous in San Francisco, the, the D school at Stanford University. I've linked uh, to, to both of them to some resources if you want to explore uh, design thinking more can really get you thinking, but it's a very it's a very deep process. A lot of that has to do also, it's a good way to think about audience is because you're, you're interviewing people who would be your potential audience. And this of course has to do with, you're spending a ton of time in the early stages of brand development, or you have some money that you're able to put into the organization to take that time to do that launch well. And that's of course why these you know big corporations spend so much time in the interviewing stage in the design thinking stage to go into it but with but what what i really want to talk to you about here is 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 mood boards for everything right this is a mood board for our film a prayer beyond borders where we were really using like what are the what are the shots we're looking for we use this with the film team of course i use trello i love trello because you can uh, you know, do all kinds of things with it. You can use it as a product man. Uh, it's mostly used the product management tool, but this is an example of where it's used for film to give. You know, this film was made with about a group of, with a group of fifteen filmmakers, about ten different cameras on both sides of the U.S. Mexico border, and so to have all that that diverse group of filmmakers coming together to have them understand the the visual and the, the ideas of what we wanted, it was really important that we give them this mood board uh, to help them think this through. You can use, um, of course, the same way you're building a brand, making a film is very much like that. You want a, a, what is your film language is the language they use rather than what is your brand language or your institutional language or your design language, right? So what is your film language here? So again, you can make a mood board for a project. Um, so putting in, you can link to, and you'll see in another one, I have all these different designs that I like that we link to, to, to show examples of where I want the design inspiration. I want the designer uh, to take from. And so within thinking about um, this first step, right. Of, of brand building, Go back to the slide of, of, of building a brand. Again, let's go into the types of branding. So we we're, we talked about a brand audit where you really can dive into the, your different layers of content, what you've made, what you want to make. With that, you can do your audience development and really think about who your audience segmentations are. And then you go into to brand building. So you've strategized and thought a lot about the type of brand you want to build. You've, you've spent some time working with the designer on the mood board or you know, you could be like me with, you know, this is an example of, of, of how I built the, the set of companies that I've built now, where this is iteration one, right? Way back in 2012, where I first used this term, Ummah wide, which Ummah is the Arabic word for, commu uh, for community. It can mean global Muslim community. It can also mean a uh, community of people. And so I was using it here as like community wide, worldwide, how we connect with people. But I'm thinking that as a Muslim in the West, living, it, coming from the context as a Muslim minority, right? Whereas the big di one of the biggest differences between Muslims are who Muslims are as, uh, as Muslim within Muslim majority populations and when within Muslim minority populations. And so for me, thinking of, you know, Umma wide, I, I was thinking of it obviously in my own context as a Muslim living in California, very progressive background, you know, social justice oriented, that type of language. I wouldn't know how it would resonate with people around the world, right? So this is our, what we call, Iteration number one is the MVP. It's your minimal viable product. And so for me, the minimal, the minimal viable, the minimum viable product is just about getting the idea in front of people. 
right? The, I started giving talks about this idea of Uma Wide or how we build community. I started sketching out what this would look like as a technology company actually first was my first idea. I was in this, I was in this tech incubator um, in this course in San Francisco. And I was actually thinking about this first as a technology company that we would build as an alternative form of social media to connect people and use as an educational platform for people to create empathy and understand people in a different way. That was actually my first thought. Then I began thinking of it uh, as a social justice platform, right? So iteration number two is, is what I was calling the, uh, the Muslim Unity Center, right? This was iteration number two, where I started really, I wrote this whole research report, and this was before I understood the idea of a pitch deck and getting ideas really concise and, and how to even, I didn't really know how to approach investors or donors at this time, uh, you know, in my life. And so I wrote this research report, spent way too much time on it, put this proposal together, the good thing is, is that I got a lot out of it because I got a lot of my own, I, I got my own clarity. I got my thinking clear as to what I wanted to build. So it was clear to me now that the Oma Wide piece was a, was a technology company. So I had to create something separate from that. And that's what I was calling at this time, uh, the Muslim Unity Center. And so then, so then next, um, Iteration number three is what I called Uma Wide, right? So this is the idea. Here I'm talking about both branding, iterating, and learning from your data, and rebranding, right? Understanding that I know that I knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I knew that I wanted to connect people around the world and uh, connect diverse audiences, connect Muslims, connect people who believed in social justice and social transformation, spiritual transformation in our world. I didn't know exactly how I was gonna get there, right? So, so next I launched this company. I, I shifted Uma Wide more, I shifted it into a publishing platform. So we launched umawide.com, which we built on Medium, uh, which is a really, probably the easiest publishing site in history to use. We used that to, to launch in 2015, 2014 and 2015, and we really tested this idea of global Muslim youth audiences. And you know, I was it was really interesting to me that that and and during this time I also spent a lot of time traveling the world and we we had this really Arabic heavy um, design palette right? This says Kuala Lumpur. The one that's the picture of the Bay Bridge says Bay Area in Arabic. And then obviously the other one says al Qahira, which is Cairo. And these were cities that I was traveling to at the time and pitching uh, this idea all over the world. And so it, it did connect me uh, to people around the world who were interested in the idea. We were able to, we actually had really good brand growth and it was through uh, a number of, of really creative articles about artists and uh, Muslim entrepreneurs and startups and social justice that we were we were able to grow. But what I but one of the really interesting uh, feedbacks for that brand was that it it didn't resonate in Muslim majority uh, populations because the idea of Ummah was so tied just to Muslims and the idea of of how you bring Muslims together. That so to to Muslim youth uh, the language. The, the brand was a little bit difficult for them, which was very surprising to me, actually, right? I, I had no idea that that would happen until I started, you know, having those inter interviews with my with consumers and customers. And I was getting the, the feedback from the brand from them in a, in a really deep way. And then and then, you know, so that's 2014. Right. And then what I also realized at this time is that is that these are two separate companies. Right. One company uh, is is going to be now Umawide. No longer, it's no longer a tech platform. It's no longer uh, a social justice platform. It's just a publishing platform for telling the diverse global stories of of Muslims, right? But then, at the same time, I started working with my friend uh, Linda Sarsour to really deepen the, this idea of how we would go, how we would build a brand for Muslims. So this is. Uh, for, for social Muslims for social justice in the United States. So this is iteration number four, 
right? So, so I keep them wide as as a brand. I separate the two, and we we begin to start talking about learning this this tech really tech heavy social justice platform, similar to Color of Change or like Change.org, right? That would really focus on Muslim uh, con Muslim consumers, Muslims who cared about social justice, and I work with on all these brands. I work with my partner Kasim Arif from you know the Netherlands, who I love. He's one of the best designers in the game. I highly, highly recommend if you have the money to work with Kasim, you work with him. Now he's a really expensive designer because mashallah, he's done so much, right? And he's he's worked with so many incredible brands all over the world. But but to think about where we were at, I give him this idea. Look, we're between a couple of names. And we, we finalize it, right, where we're like, okay, we're going to go with Muslims stand up. This was the brand. And so Qasim, this is what he sends back to me, right? Uh, one looks kind of like an upside-down American flag. One looks like uh, a football patch, right, or a soccer patch of, of a logo for a, a soccer team. Uh, the other one looks kind of generic and, and just looks like it's written, right? And then the other one looks like Laurel's. From a uh, this one looks like laurels from a film competition or a film festival, and then we actually were going to go with number one, and and then I started, I, you know, I, I took the time to really talk to a bunch of my my artist friends, and and really dive into does this brand resonate with you, right? Muslims stand up, um, and the answer was was no, that it it. it it sounds like Muslim stand-up, right? It would be might be a good brand for Muslim stand-up comedians. It didn't sound like something that could be taken seriously in the social justice arena. So then that's why, again, art direction is so key here that you really understand as a founder, as someone trying to build something, what it is that you want. And so I began looking at different, you know, Islamic design motifs, and and I looked at this um, this design called Hizb Bahir, and this this design historically actually is a is is about Jerusalem, and it's the meaning of it is the city of Jerusalem, and this design is used throughout the the city of Jerusalem, and so we wanted to think, of course, about the Palestinian people within our work, um, Linda, of course, being a prominent Palestinian. And so I, I said, Kasim, why don't you dive into this idea uh, of this design? Really think about what, how that would, how would this allow us to be a more authentic brand in the Islamic space, right? And so from there, um, so Kasim, then Kasim finally gives us th this design, which of course ends up being the logo for Empower Change. But this is an example of how within that uh, brand development, you're, you really have to have a, a, a high level of an idea what you want. That's why the mood boards are so important. If your designer doesn't want to make you a mood board, either you didn't pay enough money or they're not experienced enough. Um, if, if you don't want to take the time in building your own brand, uh, to create a mood board to really dive into what it is you want, then you're probably then you're probably not going to get what you want in most cases, right? You're you're going to get you're going to get a, a brand job that that you're not going to be happy with, and so it's really really important that you provide art direction um, as much as you can. And so I think that that's why again it's important. And maybe if you as a founder aren't the creative, maybe you're more the technical side, or maybe you're more the business side. It's really important that you that you have people around your company or your business that are uh, that are creatives, right? That consume creative content, or you just make sure you find the right creative partners uh, who can do the work for you and who can interview you and can really understand from you what it is that you want specifically. Um, and if you, because if you don't have that, again, you're you're never going to be satisfied with what with what you get. So that's an example of, of of brand building, right? And then and then and then I iterate further within my own life and with my own work. 
And number five becomes life beyond borders because I realize that I also, you know, I also I care so much about the social justice work and social impact space that I don't want to just work with Muslims, right? And I realized that I was pigeonholing myself by just having a company called Umma Wide or even Umma Wide and Empower. And so again, I I split off uh, to, have, to create my production studios, which originally was called life beyond borders and we were going to go again in the publishing direction and i wrote this manifesto and and all of these things but then but then i realized that you know what um as much as i love publishing and this i know there's some people in this group who care a lot about digital publishing digital publishing matters the most when it's deep content today because the majority of, of content uh, in the digital public publishing space that's growth oriented is what we call quick content or throwaway content where that content is meant to drive traffic to your website. It's going to last for a day or two, literally. And then no one's going to think about it after it has whatever social media lift it gets from you sharing it from your platform, sharing it from your partner, sharing it. And then after that, poof, it's gone. Right. And so I realized I was much more interested in doing deep content also. So that's why I moved away from full-time publishing, um, and, and moved our, our, our brand studio more in a film and video heavy, heavy direction. And then, and then of course, iteration number six in 2018, I re I renamed it beyond border studios because it, again, the SEO is better. What is life beyond borders? It's not clear. Beyond Border Studios, it's very clear, and, and it's very clear at an aspirational level that this is what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to live beyond borders. We're trying to dream beyond borders. We want to create culture beyond borders, live our faith beyond borders, love beyond borders, think beyond borders, right? Have an, an impact beyond border, borders, and inshallah, if, you know, when this virus ends, we'll be able to, to roam again uh, beyond borders uh, in, in peaceful ways. And then finally, iteration number seven um, is, is, of course, the work that I created most recently with the Center for Global Muslim Life. And that's, you know, where I also understood it became clear to me that, like, trying to raise money for Ummah Wide as a venture-backed business didn't make sense, right? It made more sense as a nonprofit. So in 27, so this year we launched as a nonprofit with the Center for Global Muslim Life. And, and again, uh, design motif heavily inspired by Zalij Tiles, heavily inspired by Islamic design motifs. And, and again, a language, it's important to point out here too, a language that now is very future oriented and is about building the future of global Muslim life with this idea and an understanding that that people aren't doing uh, this work, right? That people, that most of the majority of our institutions are very reactionary. And so, and so again, it's how do you, how are you uh, aspirational in your brand? How are you, how do you use clear language with what it is that you're trying to do um, in your branding and in your brand building? And again, like I tell you this story in no way am I like, oh, I want to tell you the story of, of how I had to iterate seven times, five, six, seven times to get where I wanted to get with these set of companies that are now three separate companies uh, and, and the one on Hawaii no longer existing uh, in the real way, but existing as a nonprofit now. Um, I tell you that to say that this is about iteration. It's about the ability to listen to audiences it's about an understanding of, of what makes sense at the right time. I also think that ideas ideas can be before their times. Um, so you may have an idea that you put out in the world right now that may not work, and maybe it'll work two years from now, right? And so I think that's what part of this is about for me as well, is really understanding that um, in a deep way. So again, um, so now we're going to talk about brand shifting. So talking about brand shifting um, is interesting, right? Because often when I, I, I work with clients and, and oftentimes they're super stuck on their brand and they're not willing to move it or it's an old school brand that's like 20 plus years. And in the, in, in the instance of this organization, the Council on American Islamic Relations, a US one of the largest US-based 
social justice nonprofits in the United States, uh, they're not changing their brand, right? Their logo, they have a very specific story they've told about their logo for 20 plus years. They haven't changed their logo really since their founding. They tweaked it a little bit. And so what I realized I had to do for them uh, is that I had to do brand shifting. And so we bring out these ideas, right, of like, okay, so again, always drawing on these ideas of Islamic design motifs. Um, but but how do we how do we then think about there's this classic Cuban style poster I love that has Arabic, Spanish, English, and French on the posters because it was the idea of connecting the third world at that time. And so we use that for our first piece we did within this campaign was really focused on um, was this the film that we were making, a Prayer Beyond Borders and talking about this idea of how do we pray beyond borders. So we use that language where we, we brought in this, this motif from the Cuban design standard, and we use the three different languages together to really tell a story, right? This is just design we have from Lufthansa. Um, I actually saw this in a Monocle magazine where they had a two-part um, brand overview of how Lufthansa, Lufthansa, the German airline, was changing, was rebranding, and how they were subtly rebranding because, again, very old brand. They don't want to change their brand completely, but they knew they wanted to do a brand. They wanted to brand shift, and so I, I loved the the design posters of that they were using as really simple design. And so we began to use that with language that was like, how do we build and defend our future, right? Um, so anyway, and that and and then so much of this has to do with again brand shifting. Even if you're just brand shifting, this is really about how do you how do you bring uh, lots of things? How do you bring all these different elements together? So one right, especially if you're trying to tell the story of people, it's really important that you have the right visuals, you have the right photography most a lot of social justice organizations and social impact organizations especially in the muslim space don't have great uh you know they don't hire photographers or or they they don't have these huge photo archives and so it's really important that you think about the photography that you think about the fonts that you're using again that you think about the the copy and the language so build and defend our future and it still is clear that this is the care brand but it's trying to show it's showing with this brand that we're moving in the right direction a quick story about this photo is that this is an example example of how you as a creative have to be so quick on your toes in these moments that we had uh, a photographer that we ha had hired that day for this for this rally that we had in san diego uh we had had there were other photographers that were there that we could get photos from but as i saw this this shot emerge in front of me and I was actually standing on the stage in this moment. And so I took out my iPhone and I captured this photo because I, I saw it all come together, right? That this is, this is actually a rally about um, after the New Zealand massacres that happened in 2019, where the community, a, a really diverse group of people came together. And so it was a very heavy moment, but I knew that I knew when I saw this all emerge in front of me that that was the imagery that I was looking for the in, entire rebrand, right? And so I was able to capture it in that moment by being quick on my toes and, and having an understanding enough about production myself uh, and, and being a producer myself that I, that I knew how to capture it in the moment, right? So, so further, how this was, was, was brought out, this is with uh, the Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, how it looked uh, in public, how we use the PR again to show that we were working on very different issues by working uh, on the border issue, by working on the US-Mexico border, by showing Muslims in ways that you usually don't see Muslims. And so it's, it's how are you constantly, as a storyteller, thinking about ways to tell a story where it hasn't been told before, or that is, a, is in an un unexpected way. And especially with, with PR, you know, this was the biggest, one of the biggest stories about Muslims uh, last year, right? In 2019 in the United States was the work that we did on the border mosque. And it was a national story because it was so unique. It was so creative. And it showed this really amazing group of Latino Muslims, uh, you know, in the film that we, that we linked to. But we got like, we got repeated different national media hits, including now this. 
and 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 some really interesting Mexican media about about that story as well, and the Mexican media telling the story of Muslims from a much more human perspective than the way the media does in the United States, right? All because we're coming up with unique story angles, uh, and, and so it instantly completely changes uh, the brand uh, of an organization and moves in powerful brand shifting directions. Again, we use this. Uh, we use these ayats of Quran. We use super heavy design to really show that we're moving the work in new directions and that we're shifting the organization uh, in, in powerful new directions. So now on to uh, some work with some other organizations, right? So especially in this idea of rebranding. So in rebranding, what's interesting is that is that a lot of organ older organizations? So care is not there yet, right? But but care might get there, and the reason that care would get there is, is is if they understand that from a data perspective, they are not hitting the marks that they need to be be hitting be hitting because of SEO when people search things like Muslim social justice, right? And so this organization that I worked with uh, for many years, the Pico National Network, telling the story. Of, of people of faith doing community organizing they used to so their their name was called the pico national network so so what in the world is the pico national network and then they had this you know really old you know basically generic design as their logo um for two decades right they had that and 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 the organization was founded by catholic priests uh who were founders and directors for 30 plus years and so I get it. They they're focused on the work in the community, and especially maybe back when they started, things were much more PR oriented and weren't as brand heavy as they are within our generation of of young people. Um, and so, but they but they slowly decided to shift, right? And so and so, what they ultimately decided to shift to was this idea of faith in action. And if you think about it from an SEO perspective, they had faith in action is literally exactly what they do. They put faith in action uh, around the around the United States as one of the largest faith-based community organizing nonprofits in the United States. And they also got really clear on how powerful the imagery of their network is. And so they put images at the center of their organization. They got really clear on the language that they were using as an organization. And then they can just kill the SEO game as well with their digital publishing because they're using uh, this idea, faith in action, right? We, we worked with them on a, on a number of campaigns with uh, formerly incarcerated people, undocumented, undocumented people in, in the United States. And at every single action, we're able to create these super compelling images with really powerful campaign language, um, because it's just so so obvious, like what the what the story is there, right? And how how powerful of a story that is. But if you're if you're not clear, if you're like the Pico National Network organizes today around uh, undocumented immigrants, then what? And and they're using faith to do the organizing. What did any of that say about faith? Whereas if you say the Faith and Action Network organized da 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 da. How much clearer is it for them, right? One more example. Um, so, uh, yeah, a couple more examples actually. So another great, another one of my favorite example is is with a really early story that we did did with Umawaid in 2015 with my beloved friend uh, Mokhtar Al Kanshali who this was the article we published about his work then uh, when he was first starting to, to bring, to, to try to get coffee from Yemen. And so this brand, we worked with him basically on every step. So originally the company, he wanted to call the company the Monk of Mocha. That was the first idea for the name of the company. And I was really encouraging to use it. And then there was this idea that it was too, this idea of a monk or, um, you know, a wali Allah or the awliya, the friend of God, would be too religious a brand for what he was trying to build as a San Francisco Bay Area based tech company, right? And so we agreed ultimately, and he changes the name of the company to Mocha Mill. 
the difficulty, and even the Monk of Mocha, same thing. It wouldn't have been right for a coffee company because what does that say? What does the Monk of Mocha say about coffee? What does Mocha Mill say about coffee? Most people don't think of the fact that coffee mills are a central part to the process of delivering coffee from uh, from the export, you know, from the land of from the the land of origin of these coffees. Obviously, to an exporter like Mokhtar, that it makes sense, but it still doesn't res resonate completely. So then finally he changes the name to Port of Mocha Coffee. So we worked with Mokhtar on the first website for Mocha Mill, uh, a lot of the, the early storytelling days, and then throughout as he was getting ready to launch this book that, that Dave Edgars wrote about him. And now that inshallah, we pray, will be turned into uh, a film or, or, or te uh, a television series long-term, inshallah. One more uh, final one is the Othering and Belonging Institute at UC Berkeley, which when I worked with them on this set of, of research called Build Blueprint for Belonging, where we built this, this website for them, um, they were at that time called the Haas Institute. The Haas Institute for a Fair and Equitable, Equitable Society at UC Berkeley, right? And so we talked a lot about how this is just way too long of a name. Um, it doesn't, it's not going to resonate with people. Like how are people going to ever find you on the internet? How is even in print, if you're doing PR around, around this, this work, how are they, how are people going to write that long of a name? And the Haas Institute, the reason it was called the Haas Institute to be frank is that that was the family fund that put in like $5 million or $7 million or whatever it was to launch this Institute, uh, mashallah, uh, at UC Berkeley. And and so they wanted their name on it, and they have. But the Haas the Haas family also has their name. If you live in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, long enough, you'll hear you'll hear the Haas Institute name everywhere. So finally, but a big part of their work, uh, Dr. John Powell was one of the best thinkers on race in the world, is at the center of the Othering and Belonging Institute, and a lot of his work is around reconceptualizing ideas of race. Uh, if you know this this term intersectionality, right? The, um, intersectionality is a very academic term. It's a term that, that comes from uh, women of color feminism. And, and, and it's a great term because it talks about the intersections of oppression. But uh, Dr. John Powell has been shifting that language to for race to this language of othering and belonging, that it, that our societies have to build belongingness. And this is really focused especially at a civics and politics level in the in the United States and around the world. So now they developed this like othering and belonging report. And so they're able so ultimately they decided to use, even though they do much broader research than just that one component of othering and belonging, it became clear that that's what, that's what they were being known for. And so they changed the name of the Institute to the Othering and Belonging Institute, right? And, and I think obviously much clearer name, uh, it makes a lot more sense. And so um, we, all, we worked with them on, on uh, a set of films and the website uh, to tell this story. And I think that, that it becomes super clear with that. Um, Let's see, what else? So again, let's go back. So let's go back to these core pieces, right? So that's the, that's the foundation uh, of, 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 of brand building. Uh, and it's super important that when you're thinking about these things, your brand, you're thinking about, again, every aspect that we show within that brand audit, right? The language in your copy, your fonts, your art direction, your who you are, who's gonna lead the art direction with the designer, how you develop mood boards together for different campaigns, um, how you think about your photography and having consistent photographers, how you think about your video. So that is section part one uh, of this part of class two at the Digital Media Academy. I hope that was helpful in really thinking through how brands develop, how they how they can develop over time, how they can iterate, and, and how um, you can also rebrand. And so the next session, we're gonna go much deeper into content, inshallah. Peace for now.